Hello, my friends and fiends. I do hope you are comfy and settled because today we're going to go over two fantastically creepy tales. Hardy Diet's Red Hot Wedding Day Torture, Seven Jeweled Hills, Seven Falls, Seven Dwarfs, Seven Years Encased in Seven Tombs. We've really hit the jackpot with these sevens, am I right? Too many evil plans, sharp knives, creepy dolls, glass coffins, and so many unfortunate events await us in today's adventures. So let's delve into Snow White's clearly creepy origins. But before we journey too far, today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. This free-to-play game is an action-packed visual treat for those who love strategy games and high fantasy, and I've been enjoying playing it and assembling some pretty powerful teams. Whether solo campaigns are your thing or you're more into PvP, check out Raid! And now, the Daily Login Rewards program for new players has been doubled from 90 days to 180 days. Look at this stuff, isn't it neat? Each day you log in, claim your free rewards, like energy refills, silver gems and shards, and a free barbarian legendary champion, Skyle of the Drake. It will all be sent to your in-game inbox. And what's more, new players will get 100,000 silver and one free champion, Hexweaver, by using the links in the description below. All of these treasures will be available only for the next 30 days, so do be sure to grab yours today. Thank you to Rage Shadow Legends for supporting this channel. Okay, back into some other legends. Disney does adapt their tale from the Brothers Grimm, and oh boy do they make a lot of changes to that tale. I mean, they skimped on all of the grim details and added in a six minute bath scene? Funny, when they adapt tales from Perot, they don't have to change much. Ha! Do be prepared for some gruesome and grim happenings in today's animation. Disney starts off with the evil queen finding out that she is no longer the most beautiful in the land. And then it cuts to the pretty pretty princess singing about meeting true love, hoping it finds her today. Today, dang it! And true to fairy tale form, it does! This makes later events kinda less creepy. Kinda. But still, call me jaded, but the love at first sight bit still seems a bit scary to me, like red flags all day. Even if it is sanctioned by the little birds. We don't get that in Grimm. Rather, we get a queen who, while with child, peers out of her dark ebony window frame, sticks herself and spills three drops of red, red blood on the white snow. Voila! A baby name is born. She wishes her baby to have ebony black hair, be worryingly pale, and have deep blood red lips. So, Snow White. This is more or less what the magic mirror says later on in Disney as well. Grimm's queen then gives birth and, surprise surprise, dies. The king remarries a truly vain woman who, of course, is jealous of Snow White's potential beauty. She, like in Disney, also has a judgmental mirror that makes her do all sorts of desperate things. Disney has the Wicked Queen put Snow to work as a scullery maid. That's not in Grimm's, but it is in our later tale, and oh my dang is that one so much worse. As in Disney, Grimm's Queen sends a huntsman to kill Snow and orders he bring her heart back as proof. What's with her eyes here? But Snow White is just too beautiful, and he finds he does not have the heart to take her heart, and he kind of assumes the forest animals will soon kill her anyway, so he lets her go. Just then, a boar walks by. He stabs it and brings its heart to the queen. This tracks with Disney's pig heart, who feasts on it, thinking it's Snow's heart. Mmm, what a hearty meal. Delish. Back in the woods, there are no animals to befriend and sing her back to cheerfulness, and Grimm's Snow soon gets hungry and tired and cold when she stumbles upon a little hut. There's no one inside, so she eats a nibble from each plate, sips from each mug, and tries each of the bets. One is too short, one is too long, but finally she finds one that is just right. Hmm, Goldilocks much? The dwarves return home, and rather than find a newly claimed house, they instead discover their missing food, drink, and smudged utensils, and eventually find Snow asleep. They wake her, and she explains her whole ordeal. Taking pity on her, they let her stay, but warn her, Beware your stepmother, for she will soon know you are here. Be sure to let no one come in. Hi ho, hi ho, off to work they go. And the queen, who has it from her mirror that Snow White is not dead, tries not once but three times to kill the girl. She puts so much effort and care not only into her disguises, which she does not have a handy spellbook for as far as I know, but also her plans. Yet she always leaves before Snow White actually dies, trusting that she will. Like, why not stay until you have 100% certainty for all your hard work? Her disguises run the gamut of one comb cellar. Snow White lets her into the house for some reason, despite all the dwarves warnings not to. The sneaky stepmother then stabs Snow's scalp. Is it poisoned? Rendering her near death. The dwarves come home, find her body, revive her, and scold her for being too trusting. Literally, they say, your stepmother is trying to kill you. Don't open the door for anyone. 
But of course, Snow does not learn. The queen's second disguise is a corset seller of sorts. Again, Snow happily lets her into the house the very next day because, well, I guess the stepmom had a really compelling beauty marketing campaign. You know, the kind that makes you feel so bad about yourself until you spend a small fortune on beauty products. That. Anyway, Queen tightens the laces so tight that Snow can't breathe and passes out. The Queen leaves, assuming the job has been complete, and the dwarves come home to find Snow's body, revive her, and again scold her for letting yet another stranger into the house. Third time's the charm, for the Queen anyway. Like in Disney, she disguises herself as an old lady apple seller, and her poisoned apple is something like a work of art. Exactly half of it is poisoned. When she approaches Snow with the fruit, Snow, finally a little wiser, says she will not let the woman in. But the disguised queen says she need not enter, she only wants to share her fruit. Warily, Snow asks that the old lady eat some first, just to prove it's safe. Of course, the queen eats the non-poisoned half and is fine. Snow, convinced the fruit won't harm her, bites into the juicy poisoned half and collapses. The queen leaves the dwarves return home, try to revive her, and this time, they fail. Unlike in Disney, there's no antidote for this poisoned apple. They are going to bury her, but she still looks too much alive, with red cheeks to boot. We could not bury her in the dark ground, they say, so instead make her a transparent glass coffin in which she is visible from all sides. They put her name and title upon it and put the whole thing on top of a mountain, where there's always a dwarf guard and plenty of birds. Unknown time passes. She does not age. That poison is sounding more like a fountain of youth at the moment? In Disney, the coffin is placed in what seems to be a forest glade, and word spreads far and wide about the sleeping maiden, causing her love the prince to investigate. In Grimm, of course, one day the king's son is wandering in the forest and stays at the dwarf's home, and sees the glass coffin on top of the mountain. He begs them to let him buy it from them, but for all the gold in the world, they will not sell him the body. Ew. So instead he tries the freebie route, and maybe this works because he's the king's son or something, but he says, Let me have it as a gift, for I cannot live without seeing Snow White. I will honor and prize her as my dearest possession. Ew, necro butch. Also, way to treat the human in the glass coffin as a thing and not a person? Prince Eu says as much in his profession of lust speech, let me have it and my dearest possession. Anyway, the dwarves take pity on him and give the coffin up. Gaiman and Doran's interpretation in the graphic novel, Snow Glass Apples, super not for children by the way, rings truest for me here. Maybe they didn't really have a choice but to hand her body over. Powerful king's son and all. Dwarves versus a prince's entourage. God, this stuff really sickens me. Now, even between the two brothers Grimm, there are different tellings. In Jakob's tale, Snow White, Snow White, the unfortunate child, the less creepy version of the tale, it seems. It is Snow's father, the king himself, who stumbles upon her glass coffin atop the mountain. He cries for her and then prepares to take the coffin back home to their kingdom for a proper mourning. The rest is kind of the same, just who finds her varies. Anyway, back in Creepville, I guess maybe Wilhelm's telling? Next thing you know, Prince Eu's servants are carrying the coffin and corpse down the mountain, slip and dislodge the poisonous apple bit from Snow's throat, thereby awakening her. Oh heavens, where am I? She asks. Prince he fills her in on most things and then professes his undying love and asks her to come back to the palace and tells her she shall be his wife. Need I remind you she was a child when she died, and yes, time has passed, but her body is still that of a child. I know things were different back in the day, but still. <sighs> It seems their wedding was something splendid to behold. The evil queen, of course, has to check in with her beauty consultant, Nier, which tells her that the most beautiful woman in the world is the young queen. This destroys the stepmother, who at first refused to go to the wedding but had no peace, and the FOMO was strong, so off she goes to see the new queen, who she immediately recognizes as Snow White. She freezes in place with molten rage, which is when the new king and queen have red-hot iron shoes strapped onto her feet, forcing her to dance on the burning metal until she drops down dead. The end. Happily ever after. Disney is arguably a bit kinder to their evil queen. She has a quicker death by fall and boulder. I couldn't find a written moral in Grimm's, but my probably super unpopular take, if you want something done right, do it yourself. And like, stay until the job is done. Shh. <laughs> the evil queen took, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, exclusively and kept failing. Snow in the end made sure the job was done and done with finality. For the record, I'm not condoning anybody's actions here, but both of these ladies were determined and scrappy, and if it weren't for the times in that super judgy mirror, maybe they could have teamed up and been super formidable. Alas. 
So now we get into Basile's tale, which of course is ripe with rich descriptions and more overt adult happenings. If you remember, Basile is the Sun, Moon, and Talia guy. This tale is kinda Snow White, kinda Cinderella Vasilisa. Once upon a time, there was a baron, of dark wood as it were, with a maiden sister, Lila. That maiden part is important because apparently she gets pregnant after a game of straddling a rose bush with her girlfriends. <laughs> right. Anyway, the game goes whoever can jump and clear the bush wins. Super simple, and our maiden nearly does, except that she barely brushes against a bloom and knocks a single petal to the ground. Quick as lightning, she eats the offending petal that stands between her and victory. Before three days pass, she feels pregnant. That's kinda early to tell? and nearly dies of grief for. She hadn't been up to any tricks or dirty business and couldn't figure out how her belly had swollen up. Again, after three days? That's, uh, not how that works. The fairies tell her not to worry because it was just the petal she ate. <laughs> Uh-huh. So anyway, she tries to hide her big belly and secretly unloads a beautiful daughter she names Lisa. Any connection to Vasilisa? Each fairy bestows a charm on little Lisa, but the last one twists her foot so badly that instead she utters a curse. When Lisa is seven years old, her mother will comb her hair and forget the comb on her head, where it will remain stuck and cause her to die. Is this where Grimm's got their comb trick? Also, this is kind of a mouthful to say as you trip and stub your toe. Imagine. The seven years pass and Lisa is dead by comb. Her mother, grief-stricken, encloses her in seven crystal caskets, each nestled within the other, and locks the dead girl in the last room of the palace. Lila feels her own life draining away as well and asks her barren brother to keep all her trinkets, hide the key in a writing desk, and promise no one will ever disturb that room. Huh, this is kinda reverse Bluebeard. Seven? Forbidden key? She then dies as well. Within a year, and the translator notes this may be an error on Basile's part, for Lisa was only seven when she died, the Baron brother marries. He goes on a hunting party and tells his new wife, above all, not to open the last room with the key hidden in the writing desk. Okay, kind of super bluebeard, but different. Anyway, of course she goes and opens the room and all seven crystal caskets right away and finds Lisa, now the size of a full-grown woman, lying there. Remember the translator's note about the year's discrepancy. She, of course, gets jealous of her husband keeping this secret, beautiful woman locked away. She was given zero explanation, after all. The comb falls out of Lisa's hair and she wakes up, asking, For mommy and daddy? Mind of a seven-year-old, remember? The wife poisonously says, Oh, I'll give you a mommy and daddy, and chops the girl's hair off, dresses her in rags, and gives her a juicy beating every day. The story gets very graphic bumps on her head, eggplants on her eyes, brands on her face, and gave her a mouth that looked like she had eaten raw pigeons. And that's all I'll say here. The Baron of Darkwood returns home and asks who this beaten girl is. He probably can't recognize her because she's aged seven years and is covered in marks, but like, why didn't she recognize him? Anyway, the wife tells him that the girl is a servant, or in the story itself, she's a slave her aunt had sent, who is always fishing for a beating. Mmm. Like in many Cinderella tales and other fairy tales, the Baron leaves on a business trip and asks everyone in his house what they would like as a gift. The wife, hating that this servant girl will get the same consideration as her, throws a fit and says too many, too terrible things, which I'm not repeating here. Anyway, the servant girl asks only for a doll, a knife, and a pumice stone. Hmm, just what's going on here? Nothing creepy at all. She adds, if you forget, may it be impossible for you to cross the first river you find on your way. Of course Uncle Baron forgets, and stones, trees, and debris prevent his river crossing home until he remembers and procures her requested items. Little Lisa takes the new doll into the kitchen and tells it all of her troubles. Wait, this is very much like the tale of Vasilisa. When the doll does not answer, Lisa begins to sharpen the knife on a pumice stone and says, If you don't answer me, I'm going to stick myself and the party will be over. The doll quickly inflates to life and becomes a responsive companion for Lisa, who continues to talk to her every day. Yep, definitely seeing the Vasilisa doll here. It just so happens that the Baron shares a wall with this part of the kitchen and hears all of Lisa's tales to the doll. He surmises that this is in fact his niece. 
Just as Lisa is again sharpening the knife to end it all, the Baron storms into the kitchen and rips the knife from her hand. He hears more of the story and embraces his niece, who, now under his care and protection, grows as beautiful as a goddess within a few months. He introduces her to his house, has her tell her story, kicks out his wife, and has Lisa married to a very nice gentleman, as her heart desired, quite quickly, happily ever after. We do get a moral with this tale, ready? When you least expect it, the heavens rain down their graces. What? That's just, what? Uh, pretty much just like Sun Moon and Talia's moral. Sheesh, let's get some variety, Basile. Uh, Basile set up for this tale does include warnings about jealousy, so let's roll with that moral. Don't be jealous. Jealousy makes people do terrible things. Also, don't eat rose petals. And with that, our delve into the clearly creepy origins of Snow White is at a close. I hope you enjoyed the tales, but tell me, is there anything the evil queen, in disguise of course, could say to you that you would actually fall for? I feel like telemarketer scams are her modern day equivalent and I'm always shocked that Snow falls for them. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you, friends and fiends, for hanging out with me for these tales. I do have many more exciting potions of brewing in my cauldrons right meow, so do stay tuned for some more exciting spooky, and click the bell so you don't miss a thing. Okay, see you soon. Goodbye!